All right, so this is the MSW program we're talking about here. It is a master's degree in social work. We have been here at Florida Atlantic University since 2000. Our first graduating class was in 2001. We graduated nine students that year. Um, last spring, we graduated 137. So we've had a dramatic period of exponential growth since we opened our doors back in 2000. We have been here as a school of social work much longer than that with our bachelor's program. But yeah, we started our master's program in 2000, and now we have a doctorate in social work also. And this is the second cohort, the second year that that program's been running. So you can now earn a bachelor's degree in social work, a master's degree in social work, and a doctoral degree in social work here at the Phyllis and Harvey Sandler School of Social Work. Let's see if I can figure out the clicker. So this is the building where we are. We are, with, we are within the College of Design and Social Inquiry. That is the building that kind of looks like a spaceship if you come in from that side of campus. We're behind the College of Nursing um, at the other end of the breezeway from where we're sitting right now. So I'll start by talking about our full-time regular program. This is for students who do not have a bachelor's degree in social work or who are not eligible for advanced standing. Our full-time regular program is two years and 60 credits. It's on the Boca campus, and students are on campus one to two days a week in their classes. In your first year in the program, you're on campus Tuesdays and or Thursdays. You have five classes in the fall, five classes in the spring, and at the same time, you're doing 16 hours of internship in a community agency per week. You should assume that those classes are going to be all day long and that your internship, at least about 10 hours of that, will be between 9 and 5 Monday through Friday. Okay, so this program really requires that you have either a very flexible employer or that you're not working or you're working part time. And I'm going to be really upfront about that right now because students come in, they don't have a full awareness of that, and then they get stuck at a place where they're not able to be successful. So that's a really important thing for you to be considering. In their second year, students are in classes, five classes in the fall, five classes in the spring on Mondays and Wednesdays, and they're in their internship 20 hours a week. So that's pretty much what the regular full-time program looks like. We teach our classes from the perspective of the generalist intervention model, and so we start out with skill building, where you're learning how to talk to people, how to relate to people, micro skills, meso skills, how to run groups, how to work with large organizations, and like most of our graduates want to do, how to work with individuals one-on-one -on -one in a therapeutic setting, right? So we teach you that generalist intervention model in the foundation year, that first year. In the second year, you take advanced practice courses, and that's when you really learn to be a therapist. You can also attend our regular 60 credit program part-time, and that takes four years. First year, two classes in the fall, two classes in the spring. Second year, three classes in the fall, three classes in the spring, 16 hours of internship per week. Third year, two classes in the fall, two classes in the spring. Fourth year, three and three again with 16 hours of internship per week. That second year, you start your internship in July so that we can get all of those hours in in the three semesters instead of two. So even our part-time program does require you to be here quite a bit and in your agency doing your internship quite a bit. Because even in our part-time program, you should consider that you will be spending at least eight to 10 hours of that required internship at your agency Monday through Friday, nine to five, regular working hours. And the reason behind that is that's when social work happens. So even if you're working in a hospital or a nursing home or a residential facility of some sort, you think, well, why can't I just go on the weekend? That's really not when clinical services are happening. So it's important that the bulk of your time be when other social workers are on site to supervise your work and train you, as well as when clients are available to you for therapeutic services. We have a full-time advanced standing program for BSW graduates from any BSW program that is CSWE accredited, and that's the Council on Social Work Education. If you are eligible for advanced standing, that means that you earned a 3.5 or above in your last 60 credits, wherever those were earned in your Bachelor's of Social Work program. That essentially means that you achieved so highly in your Bachelor's program that you come into the graduate program directly into the second year. So advanced standing is only 30 credits. You come right into that concentration year where you're taking those advanced clinical courses that I referenced, and you do your 20 hours of internship per week in that program. 
Our advanced standing students can also request to enter the program in summer. That enables them to take psychopathology and or some electives in the summer, which alleviates their course load in fall and spring. Otherwise, you're taking five classes in the fall, five classes in the spring, plus 20 hours of internship a week. A lot of our students last summer and the previous summer have started doing this summer entry option so they can get one or two or three or even four classes out of the way in the summer. And then when they go into their internship and into their advanced practice classes in fall and spring, they have that many fewer classes to deal with, right? So I have students graduating in May who are only taking two classes right now and doing their internship because they did all that work over the summer. So that's an option that's available to you as well. You can also come to our part-time advanced standing program, and that is a two-year program. It's still 30 credits. The first year is classes. The second year is classes and internship. And you can do that internship at the rate of 16 hours per week if you start that in July. Our program is pretty rigid in some ways. Our strength is not our flexibility or our, our ability to adjust for different life circumstances. But the other side of that is that our cohorts become very close. You're in the same classes with the same people every semester. You develop really close relationships with other students and they support each other in peer groups and work on projects together. They do all kinds of things, um, not even on campus. This is, I think Patricia's in this picture, right? <laughs> Who was both Patricia and Kate are our graduates. So you could also maybe get a job here when you're done, right? And we do all kinds of things um, through our student organizations. We participate in races and fundraisers and all kinds of different activities designed to give back to the community in a way that's creative and fun and really allows for an expression of creativity that, that really adds a lot to your learning experience, especially when you're doing it with your peers, right? This is at JAFCO. Has anybody heard of JAFCO? JAFCO is Jewish American Family foster care agency in Broward that provides, um, they host our interns every year and we partner with them for different events as well. So Patricia's in this picture as well. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually our advisory board. So we have uh, people representing uh, agencies in the community and uh, they join our board and uh, the work that they do is very important. So you guys are gonna hear about um, scholarships and uh, uh, things that we And we are really entrenched in the community as you know, we have contracts with over 300 agencies to host our students. All of our work is really closely tied to community efforts. We get practice questions from the community and try and give those back. You know, we try to really engage with the community in meaningful ways because they're the ones that can tell us what we need to do to get you hired upon graduation, right? So they, we are very closely knit in terms of gathering information from the community to inform and advise on our curriculum because we want to prepare you to be clinicians here in this context. And thus the community tells us how we would need to prepare you best for that eventuality. This is a class, one of the summer classes at the HIV Museum in Broward. Uh, we have some really interesting and creative electives, especially in the summer. Um, this is a one week class. It meets nine to four for five days, which sounds kind of difficult, but it actually includes two full day field trips. So this is one of the field trips for our human sexuality elective that happens over the summer. They visit the AIDS Museum, they tour, they meet with the director of that museum, and it's a great experience. So we really try, even when you're not in your field practicum, we try and get you out there in the community, meeting people, getting to know what's going on, getting to understand what it is social workers do in the community. Too bad Sarah's not here to <laughs> present on this. This is yoga. So we have classes on mindfulness, on stress reduction, on positive well-being. And so this was one of our instructors, Robin Rubin, actually took her whole class out into the green grass to have a yoga class right during her class session. So our classes are three-hour blocks, but we try to make them experiential and interesting and exciting as much as we possibly can. And so this was one of the favorites of the class that semester. <laughs> We have a child welfare certificate that's a big part of our program. I actually teach within that program, and this is actually one of our students at a foster care agency in Broward County. Um, you can work towards a child welfare certificate by taking two graduate level child welfare electives and doing one of your internships in a child welfare agency. And that enables you to graduate with that certification. 
It's not the same as the child welfare certification that you receive after school when you are employed by a child welfare agency, but it does enhance your resume and indicate that you have a specific skill set that's very attractive to child welfare agencies. Lots of students are interested in this particular certificate that want to go into child welfare. These were students visiting an equine therapy program, this also in Broward. I don't know why all these pictures are Broward tonight. Um, we would love to have interns working there, and we we're trying to work on that relationship. But this was another field trip as part of an advanced practice with adults course in which they learned how equine therapy is utilized to help support victims of trauma. This is one of our students demonstrating music therapy in the classroom. So our projects are experiential. You would expect to be doing role plays and presentations in this kind of a scenario in all of your classes. We do require a lot of papers and a lot of writing, but as much as possible, we have people learning in vivo, right? So not only during your field practicum, but in each class, we're really gonna wanna have you exposed to and experiencing what it's like to be in that situation, both as a therapist and as a client. So you get to play both roles and really get a deeper understanding of what that's gonna be like for you as a practitioner in the community. This was one of our projects that we did with our concentration students. I guess that was last fall, looking at the graduates. That's Lisa and John, and these are my favorite students. And they were doing, um, learning about different um, interventions used with children young children specifically. So we have placements that utilize interventions like this. We have others that utilize like non-directive sand tray therapy. We have all kinds of interventions that are taught within our advanced practice with children class. And not only do we teach you the overarching theories that inform those interventions, but you'll learn a lot about the individual interventions as well. And you can take electives in specific interventions. So you could take a whole class in cognitive behavioral therapy, for example. You could take a class in play therapy. So we're going to teach you the overarching theories, then we're going to get specific in our practice classes, and you can take electives to further inform you in areas of interest in terms of what you want to do, what your specialty is going to be postgraduate. Not that the learning ends after you get out, you know. So like the ones who take cognitive behavioral therapy, for example, we had a whole cohort that then took a postgraduate cognitive behavioral class after graduation to get certified in cognitive behavioral therapy. That is what the community is telling us they want from you all, is really specific knowledge and particular interventions so that you can jump in, you know, postgraduate, you can jump in and practice with, with children and adults and families and groups. Oh, here's Sarah. So this, was a Phi, this is a poster about Phi Alpha. Phi Alpha is the honor society for social workers, and it's a national designation. And so every school of social work has their own chapter. And this was a project they did. They actually put up a labyrinth right there next to the school. And we spent two hours walking the labyrinth as a method of meditation and mindfulness that's being utilized across our community for stress reduction and to treat trauma. This was part of an advanced practice with children's class. They went over to the Child Development Center that's operated here on campus which is run by one of our graduates and a social worker. She provides opportunities for students to come in, to observe, and to run therapeutic groups with the kids there. So it's, again, an in vivo experience of what you'll be doing postgraduate. And everybody takes practice with children. Everybody takes practice with adults. So you're going to get exposed. Even if you think you never want to work with a child in your life, we're going to make you <laughs> get those skills and practice those skills. Because theoretically, when you graduate, you'll have the skills to work with any practice area. And you might choose to work with kids for five years, and then you might find that you want to do something different, right? You might work with the elderly. You might work with the chronically mentally ill. By teaching you that generalist intervention model and insisting that you get experience with those different populations, you're going to be prepared for that. That's one of the nice things about social work is that you can switch it up. You're not just being taught to work with a particular population. You could spend 10 years doing one thing, and then, then you could come to a university and do something entirely different. <laughs> We have a lot of veterans in our program, and in fact, we are in the process of developing a concentration in veteran services that's, again, related to trauma. You'll hear trauma being um, referenced very often because as a community and as a practice, we've determined that trauma is at the, at the heart of many problems that we're seeing in our communities. Um, it turns out that victims of child abuse and veterans have identical symptoms when it comes to PTSD. So they're having the same experiences, even though their trauma experience was different. So we do have a lot of veterans here. We have three electives in how to serve veterans specifically. 
being taught by veteran social workers. We also have a huge relationship with the VA here in Palm Beach County, and we place multiple students there every year. So that's a relationship we're proud of and that we're continuing to grow. Every year, our students go to what is called Lobby Day. Has anybody heard of Lobby Day? Did anybody go in their bachelors? A couple hands. OK, so they just got back. It was quite a trip. The Lobby Day was very early in the semester this year. What they do is they gather before they attend Lobby Day as part of their policy class and talk about what policies they'd like to advocate for when they're at Lobby Day. They prepare their advocacy plans. They make appointments with particular representatives to visit while they're there. They have sat in on the Supreme Court hearings. They have sat in on all kinds of really interesting activities that happen at the lobby level, at the, at the congressional level, rather. Um, that gives them great experience with political advocacy, which is another huge practice area for social workers. We are ethically required to fight for social justice for oppressed populations. So that makes us a little different than some of the other disciplines. So while we are therapists, we also have that ethical obligation to be advocating for oppressed populations at the macro level. So we don't require our students to go to lobby day, but if they don't go, they have to write a 15-page paper. <laughs> so lots of them go. <laughs> they often report that's the best experience they had with us because who wants to be in macro social work right none so <laughs> after they get a lobby day we get some takers we get some people who start to see how significantly you can impact practice and policy at the community level by advocating at the macro level so we do have that class policy that is macro in nature and um, as well as practice three which includes how to practice with communities and organizations that also teaches that practice at the macro level and Lobby Day is kind of the culmination of that activity. Around the holidays, we often have, like I said, different activities where we stuff backpacks for foster kids. We gather food for different initiatives. Patricia this year spearheaded an initiative where it was pumpkin pie kits, right? They, um, we collected lots and lots of recipes and ingredients for pumpkin pie and put them into baskets. And Patricia delivered those to adopt a family in Lake Worth. Oh, Kate as well was part of that. Delivered those to adopt a family in Lake Worth so that families could have that experience of baking a pie with their family together. And that's, a, that's an agency that serves families who are or are imminently at risk of becoming homeless. So we do lots of activities like that as well. Here they are at the Palm Beach Children's Hospital a couple years ago delivering all the wrapped presents, which was also really fun, at St. Mary's. This was at the Delray Beach Children's Garden. So again, it's a field trip, right? We're out there doing what we're practicing, what we're learning about. And so they all went out to the Children's Garden and planted it. This was right at its inception. They just had their two-year anniversary over the weekend, so this was a couple years ago now. But this was another way to get involved with kids, the community, oppressed populations. It's in an area that deals with a lot of poverty and other issues related to poverty. So the students were all immersed in that area, in that neighborhood, and they went out multiple times to work with the garden on different projects. And this was part of their Practice Three class, that practice with communities and organizations. This was a field trip as part of that class. This is more planting. <laughs> so they get their hands dirty, literally, right? She doesn't look really happy. I don't know. <laughs> this was a presentation that a couple of our students did for Compass. So we have a lot of students who come to us wanting to advocate on the behalf of um, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender communities. And so we partner with those communities in Broward and Palm Beach County, and we have interns placed in those communities, and they attend our job fairs. And George is actually the director now of the Compass programs, I believe, as well as Hugo, who attended here as well. So we have graduates in a lot of these agencies now that are happy to host our students and give them the experience that they had when they were coming through the program. This is lobby day again. I think this is the year they got to sit in on the Supreme Court. And this is call her Dr. D right here, Dr. Leanne Derigne, and she's the one that coordinates the Lobby Day activi activities. She's an amazing macro level social worker who has in the past year been quoted in the New York Times. She's been on TV multiple times. Her research this past year has surrounded the impact of sick leave on other factors in a family. So if you don't have paid sick leave, does your kid have the required vaccinations? Um, are you able to attend well visits? So that's sort of the way that the macro level advocacy impacts practice at the, at the family level. 
and that's it. Mine were mainly photos. <laughs> what questions do you have about the program? Go ahead. So everybody does two internships. One of yours would be in child welfare. It would not be in addition to the expectations of the program overall. It would just simply be that we would place you in a child welfare agency because you express that interest. And I didn't mention, we also have a certificate in work with the elderly, where you take the elderly, working with the elderly elective, and you do one of your placements in a population serving the elderly. So that's the other certificate you can earn right now. We are in the process of developing that certificate in working with veterans, as well as one in substance abuse. You could, yeah, because you could spend one year with the elderly and one year with child welfare. You could indeed. There is a process where you could apply to have an own agency placement. If your agency was one with whom we already had a contract, and our director of field visited that agency and was convinced that the work you would be doing would be completely different than your normal activities, then it could be approved. It has to be completely different. It can't be your regular working hours, but it's still easier to walk across the hall than to get in your car and drive to an internship, that's for sure. Sure. Sure, but we place you in your internship. We make that connection because the agencies that we place you in, we have contracts with, we have trained the field instructors there to provide you the support that you need. However, if you're working with an agency that you think would be a good fit for our, play, for our program, we are happy to visit them and work out, you know, find out the details and if that's going to be a good fit for you. The requirement is that the agency has to have a social worker there to supervise you. So that's where we get stuck sometimes. Some agencies have mental health counselors or marriage and family therapists, but not social workers. And social work does require that you be supervised by a social worker. Either is fine, as long as they have two years of postgraduate experience. Does one of you want to speak to? I'm going to bring the field team up to answer the field questions. So you have to talk on the mic. Presentation you and want to then, do that? Uh, that we can answer, answer those questions, questions, okay? Write it down. Don't forget. So my name is Patricia Gossifson, and I'm one of the field faculty. We have, that's me, my office is located here in Boca, and uh, we have four uh, field faculty. Uh, we have one, and we have me and uh, myself and Georgia. Georgia Brown is the coordinator of our program. Her office is also here in Boca. And uh, we have Everest Ambrus. Uh, his office is in Davie, in Broward County. And uh, we also have my colleague, uh, Kate, right there, and uh, her office is in Jupiter. So that means that we have, we place the students from uh, Miami all the way to, um, I can't remember how far we go, Vero Beach. So we cover all this area. So that's why we have each one of us in one particular area to be able to have contact with those uh, uh, internships. 
So um, social work is a professional program. So it's not like a lot of programs that we see that is just a classroom and that you uh, just learn from the book and theories. It's, uh, even if you're doing the BSW program, uh, the internship for the BSW program is at the end of the at the end of the is the last semester of the program. So at one point or another, you're gonna have the opportunity to practice what you learn in a classroom, and uh, and that's what we do in field. And um, I also graduated from FAU with my MSW. I'm very biased about our program. And uh, you saw that I'm in every picture that you saw there, almost all of them. So um, I went to, uh, I had the most amazing time in this program. I was changing careers. So uh, being in field was very important for me because that's what gave me exposure to what our social work field looks like and what are my options and uh, the different areas that I could work uh, in our community and also how our community works in the social work field. I had a lot of fun though. I went to London with the study abroad. That was fun. So, um, uh, yeah, so the process, uh, some of you already have been through the BSW program, so you know our process for uh, application process for field. Uh, for those who are not familiar, there will be a form that you need to complete, and then we have a database called IPT, which you're going to be provided with the login information. You go there and you're going to fill out the application. So after the application, you're going to receive an email from us saying that your application has been received. If there is any information that we miss, we will let you know so you have a chance to correct that. Uh, and there will be a face-to-face -face interview with one of us. So why is the interview is so important? Um, during the application, we also ask you guys to give us uh, some options of uh, your interest, your area of interest. So during the interview, we want to have the conversation with you to see uh, what your interests are. And it happens sometimes that what you put on the paper, when we start talking, something new comes up. And you're like, you know what? Actually, this is what I meant when I, when I put this information here. So it's very important. So our goal is to make a good match, uh, match you with a good uh, internship. We want that to be a good match for you and also for them. A lot of our students get actually hired by their place of uh, internship. So that means that they are really satisfied with the students that we send, and that's the opportunity that we want to provide for you guys. Um, so after the interview, we make a referral to the agency, and then you have an interview also at the, uh, at the organization. So saying that this is a professional program, um, all the interviews, every time you hear about interviews, is all professional. So all the etiquettes that it's that required for every single interview is required for when you come to interview with us and when you come to interview with your agency. So you're going to hear a lot about the code of ethics, professional and ethical behavior, um, because we are analyzing you. We're preparing you to develop those professional skills. So when you graduate, uh, we don't want you to be like begging for jobs. We want them to be begging you to work for them because you like one of the best. Um, in, in the community, and we actually hear, hear that a lot from our field instructors in the, in the community. I also supervise the students uh, for uh, FAU and, uh, and also for the universities, and now I, I agree with the feedback from a lot of our field instructors that our students in FAU is actually more uh, well-trained than a lot of uh, students that come from another um, um, universities. So we have, if you are a foundation student, it means that if you're in the first year of the program and you're doing the, uh, the regular uh, two-year program, so if you come in full time, you're going to start your internship on the first semester, right? And you're going to start your internship on the first semester. And uh, if you're part time, you're going to take some classes on the, on the first, I mean, on the first year. So 
If you take, if you come part time, you're gonna start. You're gonna take some classes on the first year, and in the second year, you're gonna do your internship. So for the MSW program, you're gonna stay in the same internship for two semester. So for the foundation year, you're gonna stay in the same internship for two semester, and the concentration year the same thing. Um, so the placement for the foundation year is not a clinical placement. So some of you who come with the BSW background that have been through internship for the BSW program. So that will be similar. The same expectations that, uh, was, uh, that we had for you for the BSW program for the internship is gonna be the same. The concentration program is a full-time program. Uh, we have uh, the advanced standing program also, uh, which is uh, you come in, you don't have to do the first, uh, the, the first year, the foundation year, you come straight to do the concentration year. Joy spoke about that. So if you come with the regular program, uh, in the second year, you're going to be doing the concentration uh, internship. And uh, if you come for advanced standing, of course, you're going to start also the internship. And that's the clinical internship that we have, OK? Um, some students um, decide to start the program as a part-time students. And then they do the first and the second year part-time. The, but then in the third year, they're like, you know what? I want to do full-time and just get over with. Right? So you have the opportunity to do that. Once you complete, you fully complete your foundation year, you can do the, uh, the concentration year full time. But you're gonna, of course, you need approval for that, okay? Um, so this is just a little bit um, to give you an idea of how our schedule is gonna look like for a uh, field placement for the upcoming year. Um, you're going to be in an internship, uh, for example, for the foundation, you're going to be in an internship from September 17 to December 14, and uh, you're going to take a winter break, and then you come back in January until, and doing all over again until um, April 5th, right, is the last day for foundation year. The concentration is the same thing, um, and then you'll be done on April 19th. And again, you're going to take the winter break. That's the only break you're going to have. So because you cannot take any vacation during your internship. Once you're out in the community in your internship, you have a commitment with the agency and also with the clients. So you're going to, throughout the whole semester, you expect it to be there to complete your hours, OK? Um, so we have an extended uh, concentration uh, option. Um, if you're doing that option, you're going to start, you could start your internship in, in, instead of starting in the field in um, the fall semester, you can start in the second half of the summer. So that just gives a little bit of flexibility to decrease your hours, but we will extend a little bit the time that you're going to stay there. So you're going to be there for um, two and a half semesters. And instead of doing 20 hours a week, you're going to be doing uh, 16. Um, tell, me, tell me when to stop, because I don't, yeah, OK. All right, so uh, Kate is going to finish uh, the second part of the PowerPoint, and then we'll be open for questions. OK, so I'm Kate McCormick. I cover typically the Northern County. I'm also one of the newest field members, but I am an FAU graduate for my BSW and my MSW. And I, too, have been um, in the field supervising students, and I hear the same thing. FAU has the best students. Sorry. So you guys are in the right place. Um, so these are just examples of the concentration and extended co concentration. So instead of starting your internship in the fall, you would start it in July. Okay. Um, we talked briefly about the foundation year, which is kind of mirrors the BSW. It's 400 hours for that year um, over two semesters, which are approximately 16 hours, and you are in the same placement. For our concentration year students, which would be the second year, or for people coming in with an MSW, it would be the one full year. It's 600 hours, 20 hours a week, 
Um, again, same agency for both semesters, so Jan or, um, fall and spring, and obviously summer if you started a little bit early. The extended concentration, as I was just saying, you can start in the summer in July and break your da hours down to 16 hours a week instead of the 20. Um, so as Joy mentioned, and I'm just going to reiterate it, we do ask that eight of your hours be during the day. Now, sometimes that's four hours on, say, Tuesday or four hours on Thursday, but it has to be eight complete hours during a work day because you need to see what our agencies are doing engaging with other agencies. So even if we are, say, a hospital or something that has 24-hour type um, services, not every agency has that, and they're engaging in other agencies. So we want to make sure that you see what a typical workday would look like. Um, so, And then your other hours, whether it be eight or the additional um, 12, would be, could be weekend or evenings, if that placement has that option. So, um, so for full acceptance, to be able to become part of our program, you have to be accepted to the School of Social Work before you can apply for field. So once you're accepted to that program, we are part of that, so then you would apply with us and you would go through the process that um, Patricia just talked about. Um, we teach, as part of a field faculty, we teach a field seminar course. That is a required course. That's where we talk about kind of what's going on in your agencies. You may do some role playing. You may do some bringing of your practice. We can talk about hours. We talk about all sorts of things. We've had some really interesting um, conversations that come up because, I mean, especially if you're new in the field, going into these agencies it can be a little anxiety provoking. I mean, in my, when I started my master's, um, it was advanced standing. I ended up getting placed at hospice and they were like, here you go. I had no idea what I was doing. They're like, this is the grief specialist, had no idea. So my field seminar courses were wonderful because that's where we got to kind of talk about and process some of what was happening. So it is mandatory that you attend that. Um, you're expected to complete the assignments. This is a regular course that has a regular um, grade, and we expect the same level of um, focus that, that your other um, courses would require. So if you fail to participate in field, you fail to attend your field seminar course, you fail to do the work, you may lose your spot in that course. Um, as Patricia said, the only time you're allowed to take off is during the assigned breaks from the university. That would be in December. There's a set date. You don't get to really go on vacation in your field seminar. You don't get to just decide that you want to take a day off. Right? Obviously, if you're sick, you would work that out. But as far as vacation, the only time you have off is, is that week, two weeks over the holidays, approximately. Not um, does include spring break. Yes, does not include spring break. And, but I will tell you that you also, you follow your agency guidelines. So I come from a public school system and we are closed during spring break. So any students we had actually had that off, but you had to make up those hours some way. So a lot of times we would do outside um, assignments to give you some time. Background screening is required. Be prepared. Um, it's mandatory that you disclose any issues that you have, even if you think they're not going to show up. So as part of our field interview, when you come to interview with us, we're going to talk to you about that. Um, and we need you to please be honest with us. You will likely ask to be completed drug and alcohol screening. If you test positive for any illegal substance, then you will not be placed that semester. And it's unfortunate that we have to tell you that, but it has happened, and so now we're making sure that you know. Um, and, uh, and that's mostly because um, this is an employment process. That yes. It says over county medication, it's over counter, just so you know. <laughs> Maybe you didn't catch that? No. <laughs> um, so 
we do have students who lose their placement or, or are terminated um, from our program and from their agencies. And so some of the reasons would be unethical behavior, um, attendance issues. We ask you to treat this like a job. You treat this like a job, uh, we call it the, the year-long job interview or probation period because a lot of us are hired by our agencies once we finish our internships. They've just invested a year in you. So treat it like a job. Obviously inappropriate behavior, unwillingness to accept feedback. A lot of people come in, they, they you know think they know what's going on. They are not allowing the professionals, the field educators who have agreed to supervise you, they don't take the feedback well. But please know that A, they're trained to do this, and B, that's their job. Their job is to help train you and mold you into a, to a clinical social worker. Um, walking away or abandoning your placements and your inability to really integrate theory and practice. So if you're really struggling with taking what you're learning in the classrooms and implementing it into the field, that also could be a reason. But I'll tell you that with this team, I have seen, um, we go to every length to try to make sure that you have the support and the help that you need to be able to be successful. Again, the, ch the certificate programs, child welfare and aging. Um, we ask that our students come in having read the Code of Ethics. You don't have to memorize it because we're going to refer to it a lot, but you need to have a very good understanding what it is that we as social workers um, expect of ourselves and each other as a profession. We have a Code of Ethics that we work by and for a lot of us that we end up living by. Um, there's a link. And that's it. So I will turn it over if there are any questions, field-related or program-related. Obviously, that's why we're here. So in IPT, um, as you go through, we ask you, we provide a list of agencies, and you're going to pick it basically based on what you think your interests are, okay? But when you come, as Patricia said, and you do the interview process with us, then we can talk, really look at what you're looking for, what we think we have to offer, and what might be the best fit. And sometimes you may get placed in something that you are not thinking that you want to be at, and it turns out to be the best thing in the world. So you also have to have an open mind and be open to the idea that as a, as a team, um, we know the agencies and we kind of have an idea of, of what might be a good fit. So bring your questions. Uh, we do not allow students to communicate with the agencies. Uh, this is our job and that's because the agencies, they don't want you calling them. Uh, we know the agencies, we know what kind of students they're looking for. Uh, if you guys have any questions, we'll give you information about the agency. So the only thing that we do is just send them the referral and they interview you. And uh, again, during the end, because you interview with us doesn't mean that you're already accepted at the agency. The agency will make the final decision after the interview. And uh, there are cases where when we interview students and you go there to interview and something doesn't go well during the interview. And then uh, we have to talk about that and we find another place to more uh, sort of and more specific to your question, when you're on and you're looking and you're picking your potential, like your top five choices, the agency's names are listed there. So you can go look on the website and just kind of explore what they are. No, no. 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 Yeah. And uh, like I have students this semester that they came with certain idea after we talked, um, we found something else, and uh, they come back later like, you know what? I'm so happy where I am now. So that conversation really helps you to make a decision. Can you, if you're familiar with an agency, can you request to be placed at that agency? Okay, so as social workers, we don't allow through relationship. 
So one of the questions that we're going to ask you is that if you mention an agency, we want to know what kind of relationship you have with them. So we're not going to place you at a place where you worked previously, or you have friends there, or family members, or you even if it's a place that you have been a client at before for confidentiality purposes. So, uh, but if you know of any agency, like in a professional level, and you may want to go there, we will check and see um, if we have a contract with them, and if we have somebody that just supervises you, we can definitely have that conversation. And uh, sometimes the agencies, they are uh, opening to, uh, they're so open to have you there that they will, even if they don't have a contract, they will try to get the paperwork done so they can accommodate you. So um, you said you would go from part time to full time and you know, for full time, no reason you would have never So, uh, yes. Basically, a lot of our students come in part time because they're working full time or have family obligations and don't have the ability to dedicate full time energy to the program. We would want the application process is such that you explain what's changed in your life to enable you to accommodate the full time program. Our part-time students are working full-time Monday through Friday, for example, and are already having a hard time getting here for 4 p.m. class as we do their internship. So we, what we would want to see is what's changed for you that has enabled you to be shifted to full-time. And also, the admissions committee, when we look at your applications, sometimes somebody applies for full-time and we only admit them for part-time because we want to see how they do in their coursework for that first year. So you aren't really admitted as a full-time student. That's why you have to apply afterwards to become a full-time student. And, uh, as soon as we high expectations, no, I can work full time, but I know I can do it. You can't. <laughs> I did the program here. I did the program, and I can tell you, I say, you're not going to do it. That, that is just not enough time in the day to do everything. You can be, you can have a lot of energy, but that's not enough time in the day to do everything. It's just not realistic. So we will help you with that decision. That second year is very difficult emotionally for our students. When you start working with people who have suffered trauma and abuse and homelessness and injustice, it starts getting hard to sleep at night. It starts getting hard to maintain healthy habits and engage in true self-care. And so that concentration year takes a lot out of our students. And to jump to full-time in that year without really thinking about all of the ramifications can be dangerous. And that's why we have that process in place. No. <laughs> okay. Four, but one of them has to be psychopathology. So it's not really elective. <laughs> you can. We have just started. This summer will be the first summer in which we are offering psychopathology. And if you are coming in advanced standing, I strongly recommend you take psychopathology this summer. You're going to be beginning a clinical internship in the fall in which most of the students have already had a year of graduate school under their belts and have taken psychopathology. You'll be much better prepared for your internship if you take psychopathology this summer. There are some internships that won't even take you until you've had that class. Did you have more? Yes. Mm -hmm. The deadline is May 15th. If you are accepted as a full-time advanced standing student, you can take psychopathology in the summer. You can ask Kelly Roy, our graduate advisor, to shift your entry date to summer from fall, and you can take psychopathology and or additional electives over the summer. Correct. To be eligible for advanced standing, you have a bachelor's degree in social work and a 3.5 GPA or above. But if you don't have that, if you're still coming from another field completely, then you wouldn't have that option. You would be taking psychopathology in your first year anyway as a foundation level student. Uh, the deadline for the application um, for the MLW is the same year as the
way back in the corner. <laughs> So if you had a bachelor's degree in healthcare administration, you could come into our regular program, which is 60 credits. You could complete that program in two years, full-time, or four years, part-time. All of our students, regardless of their undergraduate experience, move through the program in a cohort that we have designed and we implement. So you're gonna be taking the same classes in the fall as everyone else in the program does in the fall, and similar to spring. Everyone starts in August except if you're advanced standing and you take electives over the summer. <laughs> you could take those as a non-degree seeking student, but they wouldn't count towards your social work degree. I just want to warn you that our program is not really um, very adaptable to full-time employment. So even as a part-time student, you would expect to be here one full day in classes and be in your internship another eight hours during regular working hours, Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. Our classes begin at 4 p.m. Those are the ones that part-time students take. Full-time students are here at 9 a.m. and 1 p.m. as well. No. Nope. <laughs> if you did your if you did your if you did the BSW program with us, um, or even during the the foundation and the concentration year, we'll never play for the same agency. We want you to have a different yeah. experience, not only with different populations, but different agencies have different yeah. cultures. And so by the time you're practicing as an MSW, we want you to have at least two experiences with different practice areas, different interventions, and different agencies with their cultures and their dynamics and their bureaucracies, because that's important learning, too. That organizational culture piece is important. An internship is a, is a job experience when you're going to send in your resume after graduation. So it's right. very important that you have the diverse uh, type of exposure. Go ahead. Yes.
Well, our schedule varies, but generally our advanced standing students, full-time or part-time? Full-time, they start class, their classes are offered 9 a.m., 1 p.m., 4 p.m., and 7 p.m. It depends on the schedule you assemble, but you would expect to be here five classes in the fall, five classes in the spring, so it would probably be two days if you were full-time. One of those classes is your field seminar, and that doesn't meet every week, so there is a little bit of wiggle room in there. Yes, advanced standing means that you have a bachelor's degree in social work, so you actually come into the second year of the program. You just slide right in with those who have already had a whole year, so you're just coming into year two. It's a component of the, of the field practicum. It's three credits in the graduate program. We have a very few stipended internships that are available and very competitive. There are no comprehensive exams. There is no requirement for a GRE. These are the good things, right? There's no dissertation. There's no capstone. <laughs> Go ahead. Yes. Yes, they will be placed there soon. They're in the process of actually hiring a social worker that can supervise our students at the counseling center. That's forwarded to you after admission. And speaking of admission, Kelly Roy has arrived, our graduate advisor, and she can go through the admissions process. Good evening. Uh, my name is Kelly Roy. I'm the academic advisor for the MSW program. Sorry I wasn't here to welcome you all. I was actually in class for my own uh, doctoral program. So rule number one, always go to class. Uh, so I'm just going to take you through the application process very quickly. Um, if you have any questions about the process, usually I'm the best person to contact because I process all of the applications. I have no say in the decision. I take all of your information, I pass it on to the admission committee, they give me back a decision, so you can't woo me with any gifts or anything. But All right, so I don't know exactly what has been shown or told to you so far, but I'm assuming you've gone over the program and field requirements. So as you've heard, we have the 60 credit regular program and the 30 credit advanced standing program. Um, so admission requirements for the regular program, you can apply with any bachelor's degree from any major. You must have all of your official transcripts sent to FAU's graduate college, and that's from any institution that you've attended. Um, if you are an FAU student or you graduated from FAU, all of your transcripts are already here, so yay for you, you don't have to submit any transcripts. But if you are not an FAU student, then we need transcripts from everywhere. So if you took that one class at Miami-Dade, we need that transcript, every official transcript to the graduate college. 
if you graduated from FAU and you've taken classes elsewhere since graduation, we'll need those transcripts as well, please. Official means it arrives here in a signed sealed envelope or electronically. If you are holding a transcript that you can look at, it is unofficial. Uh, GPA, for the regular program, we look for a 3.0 GPA in the last 60 credits of your bachelor's degree. So usually those are the junior and senior level courses. And then there are three recommendations. Those are not standard letters of recommendation. We use a specific form. It's actually easier for the recommenders to fill out. It's four open-ended questions and 10 competencies that they rate you on. So don't ask your recommenders to write you a letter so you, know, you don't want them to waste their time. Just ask them if they'd be willing to complete a recommendation for you. Those recommenders can be supervisors in your current place of employment or from volunteer experience. It can be from past experiences or they can be faculty um, from any of the classes you've taken or instructors. Faculty instructor recommendations are better if you have them. Um, if not, you can do three supervisors. And with those recommendations, um, you would just provide the names and emails of your three recommenders in the online application, and then they're emailed the form to complete electronically. So you don't have to worry about bringing anything to us or mailing anything to us, everything is electronic. And then the personal statement, there's actually, um, in your packets, there's an application process handout. The personal statement instructions are in there as long as, as long, along with everything in this PowerPoint. Advanced standing, you must have a Bachelor of Social Work degree. It must be from a CSWE accredited institution. FAU is CSWE accredited. Most um, major universities are, but not necessarily. Again, official transcripts, same deal. We look for a 3.5 GPA in the last 60 credits of your bachelor's. So if you're finishing the BSW at FAU or finished it, um, those last 60 credits do include those 12 credits of field, which are pass-fail, so they don't affect your GPA. So basically it's the 48 credits prior to field that count for the GPA. Personal statement, same thing. Three recommendations, same thing. But with those recommendations, at least one of them must be from your field professor so or instructor. That is the person who teaches your actual field course, not the person at the agency. The person at the agency can be one of your other recommendations, but your actual field must come from your instructor or professor, such as Professor McCormick or Professor Gustafson. As you've heard, for the regular program, you may only begin in the fall semester. Advanced standing full-time only, you may start in summer or fall, it's your choice. Highly recommended to start in summer so you can start that psychopathology and other electives. Part-time advanced standing, you may only start in fall, just because we've had issues with financial aid, because usually you need to have at least six credits for financial aid, which is two courses, and when you start in summer, it throws it off. So we're only gonna let you guys start in fall for now. The deadline is May 1st, that's for this year. It could change in future, some, uh, future years, so just keep in mind this year it's May 1st. If you're gonna apply for a future year, do check with us. Everything must be here by the end of the day on May 1st. So on May 2nd, all of our applications are final. So that includes your three recommendations. You cannot control your recommenders, so make sure you give them plenty of time to complete it. So you should apply now, because if you complete your application on April 30th, your recommender isn't getting that email until April 30th, and maybe they'll complete it by May 1st, maybe they won't. I recommend that you apply early because your fate is in their hands. And please keep in mind, meaning minimum admission requirements does not guarantee admission. So make sure your personal statement is very, very well written and you get the very best recommendations that you can. So I said that the, electron, uh, the application process is completely electronic. So you apply online through FAU's graduate college. This is what the page looks like here on my left. Um, there's a big red button that says apply now. And then it takes you to a portal where you create a login. It's a lengthy application, it takes a while to fill out. They're gonna ask you for tons of information. There's a $30 application fee. There's also background screening, so similar to the field um, application process. They're going to ask you about any conduct issues you've had, so you must be truthful there. We have caught people who did not uh, disclose information on their actual application, and then we caught it in field, and that's an ethical issue. So be sure to disclose all of your conduct issues Many people pass through the conduct process just fine and they make it through to us. So just give us your documentation. 
All right, I already talked about all of this, so we're gonna keep going. All right, for any of you who may not meet the GPA requirements, you do have the option to submit what's called a petition for exceptional consideration. There's detailed instructions in the packet, but basically it's your opportunity if you had some kind of extenuating circumstance or something that affected your GPA in your undergraduate studies that you'd like to be, have the opportunity to explain. So basically you would just write an additional statement separate from your personal statement to explain why your GPA is the way it is and try to make your case for why you should be in our pro program and why you think your academic capabilities are better than your GPA represents. This is also submitted as part of the online application. It's a separate file that you upload after the personal statement. Now, money, we have money available. Actually, the Graduate College has money available for BSW students who are admitted for the Advanced Standing Program. So this is FAU students only. If you have a BSW and you are admitted directly into the Advanced Standing Program, so you don't take any time off, you go straight in, you qualify for a $2,000 scholarship as long as you completed your bachelor's degree in a certain, um, they say four years, but actually they go by semesters and as long as you maintain continuous enrollment and complete the master's within two years. So you would end up getting $1,000 in your first semester. That pays for almost one entire graduate class and then $1,000 in your last semester. Most of our students get it that are in the advanced standing program. I always tell everyone to apply because the graduate college does some weird calculations to determine who gets it. So just apply and let them do their calculations. Um, we had about 40 students get it last year and 40 students the year before. And then as far as the decision, normally it takes about two to three weeks to receive an admission decision, and that's from the time your application is complete. Usually the last thing we're waiting on is that final recommendation, so from the time we get that recommendation, two to three weeks, you'll receive a letter from the graduate college notifying you of the decision. You'll hear from me, you'll hear from the field office, um, and we'll start bombarding you with emails. And... That's me, my information is on your packet. Joy's information is on the packet. If you have questions about anything, you can email me, you can talk to me here, you can call me. Anything, we're here to help. Yes. That gets a little tricky for people that graduate in summer, but it's possible. Basically what you'll do is you'll complete everything except for the field. Um, so you'll just leave the field recommendation blank for now, and you'll be reviewed for admission sometime like the second week of May. Basically, if admitted, it'll be conditional, and your field recommendation will have to come in sometime in the summer. As long as it's positive when we get it, we'll change your admission from conditional to fully admitted. Um, but the rest of your application does need to be complete by May 1st, so everything else by May 1st. Everyone does it a little bit differently. Uh, my personal recommendation is to write it like an essay and to make it flow nicely. As long as you answer all of the prompts somewhere in it, I think that's better. Some people put numbers or bullet points. I mean, I don't think we penalize anyone for that either, but you know, the, the, mo the most important part is just to make it compelling and very well written. It's either, we just try to put a limit because some people like to write. Um, and our admission committee reviews almost 300 applications a year. So we just ask that you be kind to them so that they don't have to read a 10 page personal statement. You know, keep it clear and concise. So if I have four pages, would it go down to None of us are counting the okay. words, you're fine, yeah. <laughs> yep, question? Yep, so your application goes through a couple of hands. Um, it starts at the graduate college. They check to see that we have your transcripts. Basically, all they look for is a transcript that says you have a bachelor's degree, so you could still be missing other transcripts, um, but then they'll pass your application to me. Once I get your application, I send you an email letting you know what you're missing. It might be a transcript, it might be a recommendation two or three, and then once it's finally complete, I send you like a little stock email that says your application is complete, you'll receive a decision in two to three weeks. So 
you should theoretically know where your application is uh, at all times. Yes. Sort of. Um, so your bachelor's GPA can never be changed after you graduate. It is what it is. If you took courses after graduation, if you completed another degree, I would calculate a completely separate GPA. If you completed like a certificate or just took some post-degree coursework, I usually just provide a calculation in how many credits it was, whether a degree was attempted or not. But it won't count in the bachelor's GPA. Yes. It's up to you. Uh, some people get nervous and they want to actually hand it to someone to make sure it's here. If you have it mailed to yourself, make sure you don't open the envelope. You'll be able to tell what it is. Um, you can do electranscripts, which is usually cheaper, but all transcripts go to the graduate college. So if you can either have it mailed directly there, you can have it sent electronically, or you can have it in your hand and bring it there if you'd prefer. Yes. Yep, if you're from FAU, you're all set with transcripts. They should be in our system as long as they were sent to the graduate college in the first place, they should be in our transcript portal. I have seen instances where they were sent to the graduate program and they never made it there, but theoretically, yes, they should be there. Me, I can look, yeah. That's it. All right, thank you guys. So what else? We have about 100 students per cohort. Our class sizes are smaller though. Our Practice classes run between 20 and 23 students per class. We have a couple classes that go up to 40, like research, um, but genuine, generally speaking, you're going to be in a small classroom. Yes. Yes. After graduation, you receive supervision towards licensure for two years from a licensed clinical social worker. You also take an exam. After you successfully pass the exam and complete that two years of postgraduate supervised clinical work under the supervision of a licensed clinical social worker, you turn in a bunch of papers and pay a fee and you get your license. To maintain that license, you have to get, is it 20 or 30? 30 continuing education units every two years. And pay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We have our own doctoral program, so after graduation, once you are licensed or licensed eligible, you can come back into our doctoral program. So I'm not sure if that, we don't, did you ask if we had a pathway to a PsyD? No, I don't know what their requirements are. Because we're not part of that program. Is there a childcare on campus? There is, but I hear it has a really long waiting list. Like even our faculty can't get in there. A couple of them have their kids there and a couple don't. <laughs> but there is, and it's actually, we saw a picture of the Child Development Center that is a very, it's a reasonably cost, very high quality daycare center for early learning. What's the estimated cost of the program? Um, the standing is 11,000. And it's 22 for? <laughs> That's for in-state. In-state. Oh, state very expensive. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I just, I Sure. That's because Patricia didn't put it on the back row. <laughs> Go ahead.
That's going to be dependent on your, on your particular situation. So all of our, many of our students are on financial aid, and they complete a FAFSA at the beginning of each semester to determine how much aid they're eligible for. What else? Go ahead. Part-time students take two classes each semester in their first year. In their second year, they take two classes and a field seminar, as well as doing their field placement. And then that repeats. Part-time students usually only come on campus once a week. And you know, when you're doing your field placement, that can be in your local community. So if somebody lives in Miami, for example, they come to Boca once a week, and then they do their field placement locally and don't have to come here every day. <laughs> MSWs without a license generally are doing either supportive counseling or something like that like case management, supportive counseling, or therapy that's not psychodynamic or, or deeply therapeutic, right? So there's kind of a, a line between counseling and therapy that you cross when you get licensed. But there are a lot of people who are therapists at agencies with MSWs. And everybody has to start somewhere, right? You have to be doing that clinical work towards licensure. So agencies expect you to come in with a master's working towards a license. And they pay you less because they know they can. <laughs> But it's, you know, that's the path towards becoming fully licensed. That's correct. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Yes. And some people never get licensed. It, you know, we want you to. We think it enables you to move around. It, it makes you much more attractive to employers. It indicates a level of commitment and professionalism that we're proud of. So one of our outcomes, we carefully track how many of our graduates become licensed because that's something we want for you. Well, um, when you work towards CAP certification, all of our classes count. You could do your electives in substance abuse areas, so those course, that coursework would count, but it's a separate process. But our graduates have an easy time getting CAPS because they have all those internship hours and all the coursework that's related to substance abuse. It would be fall, and it might not be in time to pay your tuition. You might have to pay your own tuition and then get that reimbursed through the scholarship. Till fall. Yeah. To the for the pathways. Yes. Well, it's but it's tricky. Um, <laughs> You can't apply until you've done certain things with us. So basically, I email everyone when it's time to apply. Um, so I always just tell everyone, read your emails, please. Read your emails, read your emails. I don't email you unless it's important. So please just open it and read it. Um, I've had people miss the scholarship application deadline, and they're out $2,000 because they didn't do it. But um, usually, it'll be like within the first three weeks of your first semester that you'll do it. Yes. Maybe um, you'd have to, you'd have to ask the controller's office. I know there are yeah, payment when plans. I pay, there's a, there are yeah. Okay. Thank you. Can you make like five payments. They charge a fee to set it up. Okay. Yeah. Not that I pay, but <laughs> as a student, I've seen that. <laughs> Go ahead. You would need to contact the financial aid office directly and complete your FAFSA to see if you were eligible for any grants. But like Kelly said earlier, our students are here on, fi on loans. Um, the grants are few and far between, I have to say. At the, at the graduate level, grants are few and far between at this point. Most folks are paying or taking out federal loans. 
We have four provost fellowships that we award each year, and many of you indicated on your applications that you'd like to be considered for those. We don't award those until after May 1st when we've received all the applications because we want to look at everyone before we make those, those awards. Our provost fellows commit to working 20 hours per week with our faculty on research. So they're learning the research process while they are in the program. And in exchange, they are paid a salary for those 20 hours, as well as having some 80% of their tuition remitted. So that's what we have inside the School of Social Work to provide our students. And we're constantly looking for new ways to support folks financially through the program so they don't have to work full time or so they can you know, really dedicate themselves to this edu rich educational experience while they're here with us. Um, we've got students now, I have a student who's working for the Dean of Students 20 hours a week and having her, her tuition remitted, and we're looking at trying to create more opportunities like that. We know you need it, and we're trying to get it for you. Um, we had some students reach out and be awarded national scholarships this year, and our faculty wrote extensive recommendations for them to receive those through NASW, the National Association of Social Work. We collect information like that and share it with our entire student body. So we do what we can, but I can't promise much. For financial aid? For the MSW program? Yes, the deadline is May 1st. What did you say about March? That's financial aid. I don't think that everyone applies for financial aid by March 1st for fall semester. Um, I think the sooner the better, but you would be able to contact financial aid directly to ask them that question. I know a lot of folks do not apply for financial aid until they're admitted. It is important to remember that you're not eligible for financial aid unless you're taking six credits, like Kelly mentioned earlier. So sometimes that gets a little wonky, and it's not always available in the summer. I know, right? We just did such a good job presenting that they don't have any questions left. <laughs> We're really excited to have you here, and we really hope that everyone applies and feels free to contact any of us with any other questions or concerns. I'll stick around a while if anybody wants to come ask me a question, but I just really want to extend my thanks for you taking the time to come out here to hear about our program. I'm really excited to see our own students here, our own graduates here, coming back now to get their masters, and it's just, it's a lovely program. Our faculty has been here forever. We love each other. It's a wonderful environment to be in. Thank you very much. Take food on your way out.